One of my favorite molecules as, an ex as a sample molecule when I'm teaching NMR spectroscopy is the over-the-counter pain reliever, ibuprofen. Uh, is it's, it's a nice molecule. It's not too trivial, too small. It's not overly complex. It's something everybody's heard of. Uh, most people have even taken it at some time or another. And it's an interesting molecule. And even uh, recently, I discovered a couple of surprises in it that I wanted to uh, talk about here. But I also want to go through briefly why I think it's such a beautiful example molecule. If you are teaching NMR to beginners uh, and talking about like the opening stuff of groups and integrations, uh, ibuprofen is a wonderful example for, for teaching that. For example, if you uh, are starting to build up the skills of being able to look at a structure and predict how many resonances uh, and, and what the integrations will be in a proton spectrum, uh, you can look fairly readily at uh, the structure of ibuprofen and note that it has 18 total protons in there uh, and they should come in uh, eight different groups. There are eight distinct groups of protons in there. Um, there's a, just enough symmetry to be interesting but not be you know, too terribly symmetric here. Um, these are the eight groups. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the integrations, which indeed adds up to 18. Okay? And so for a type of exercise uh, that I've used before where you have, you know, here are some structures of pain relievers. Uh, here is a spectrum. Which one is it? Which, is, which molecule gave the sample? It's relatively straightforward to students at the beginning of learning about NMR spectroscopy to be able to do that. If you use it uh, when you're talking about chemical shifts, it's a beautiful molecule for that as well. You have this group of two equivalent protons, uh, methyl groups, uh, at the end of a long alkyl chain and giving a resonance certainly below one. You have the aromatic group. Uh, in a group between 7 and 7.5 ppm. Uh, nice, pretty uh, symmetric structure here. Uh, para substitution integrating to 4. You even have this lovely carboxylic acid resonance way downfield here, almost at 12 ppm. It very broad, but very distinctive as well. Okay, so for chemical shifts, it's a beautiful example molecule. If you introduce it wanting to talk about coupling patterns, oh, it's got some gorgeous coupling patterns in there. And none of them overly complex. It doesn't have you know, hugely elaborate coupling patterns, but you know, lovely first order coupling patterns that you would expect to see in the structure here. There's even uh, in the aromatic air region, you know, the coupling pattern starts to show some second order characteristics if you wanted to bring that particular topic uh, into the mix. It's also a beautiful molecule to introduce two-dimensional uh, cozy spectra. And those are difficult for students to learn how to work with. And you, know, you could give them something like ethanol, but you know, having only one cross peak is not that much of a challenge. This particular molecule is just complex enough that with a little bit of work you could pick out, sure enough, there are two spin systems in this thing, uh, in addition to the uh, aromatic and the uh, uh, carboxylic acid proton, two alkyl spur. There are two aliphatic spin systems uh, in here, and it's a relatively straightforward thing to figure out how to, uh, how to map those out, and it's a good introduction in how to use uh, uh, two, uh, cozy spectra in a molecule that's you know, not trivial, but not overly complex as well. Now, a semester or two ago, I was uh, using ibuprofen as a structure, group and integration, a structure matching exercises early in a term. And so I had the classic, you know, here are some pain relievers, here's an NMR spectrum, which, mole, which one matches the best, which one must it have been. And the students are making good progress. I had the proton spectrum, and I also had the carbon spectrum on there. Now, we hadn't talked about carbon that much yet, but I had the carbon spectrum sitting there as well. And uh, students were working, and get in make, you know, working on this and other particular problems and making good progress on it. And then I had a student come up and you know, do that one annoying thing that students do from time to time. They asked a question. And it turned out to be an interesting question. It was kind of annoying, but it was an interesting question. And that was looking at the carbon spectrum. They 
knew that there was a solvent peak in here, okay, right, uh, right here at 77 ppm, the chloroform solvent peak, uh, and then they said, Am I reading the structure right? It looks like there are, you know, that there are 13 carbons in the structure, but there would be 10 distinct carbons. And I agreed, you know, that there, there are 10 distinct carbons in this thing. But I only see nine carbons in the carbon spectrum. Well, at that moment, I looked at the spectrum, I looked at it on paper because it was on a paper handout, and I did, you know, what any self-respecting professor would do when confronted with a question like this. I said, well, there's obviously more advanced things going on that we haven't talked about yet. Then I made the mistake of following up. And it's a common sort of thing that I, uh, that I like to emphasize sometimes is, you know, a spectrum on paper, proton or carbon spectrum. Uh, it, it, there may be two peaks there, but on paper it's, you know, it's sometimes difficult to tell. And so having the raw data, the actual spectra on the computer screen can be really useful sometimes to be able to zoom in and expand out and see that. Otherwise, on paper you have to supply sometimes uh, you know, expansions or little offsets to try to do that. And I've done that sort of thing and talked about that in uh, previous videos as well. In this instance, we went, I had the actual raw data, and so I went up to the computer and we looked at the carbon spectrum and I pointed out, you know, that over here uh, on the downfield side, we see the, uh, two, the four aromatic carbons very nicely, the carboxylic acid carbon, and so over here on the upfield side, we see four peaks, but yeah, there should be five in there, five aliphatic carbons, and so one of them must be just two peaks that are just really close together and hard to tell on paper. So we started zooming. We zoomed each of these, and each time we did it, we saw one peak. Now, when left with something like that, you know, and the student looked like they were about to ask another question, it was near the end of the class period, so I did, you know, the second thing any self-respecting professor would do. I looked down at my watch, said, oh my, I'm going to be late for a planning meeting on our new mission statement, and, you know, ran out of the room. Made it back to the office at some point or another, and I admit, I pulled up the data on my uh, computer in the office and uh, wanted to make sure that I hadn't, you know, done something really stupid like paste in the wrong carbon spectrum uh, onto the handout. It's not like that has ever happened in the past. And no, it was the ibuprofen carbon spectrum and I zoomed it on my own computer screen and sure enough, there are nine distinct peaks, not ten. And that got me uh, thinking about it a little bit, and so I did, you know, the third thing any self-respecting professor would do, and that is I did some high-powered academic research, and that didn't yield anything particularly useful, so I did the fourth thing that any self-respecting professor will do, I did a few more experiments. And one thing that I've talked about previously is I love depth experiments. DEPT, Distortionless Enhancement by Polarization Transfer. Fancy carbon experiments where you can count the number of protons on every single one of the carbons. Tell your methyls from your methylenes, from your methines, from your quaternaries. I've done a whole video on those, and I use them routinely, but for reasons I'm not quite sure, I did not have uh, the depth spectra on this particular molecule. I just run a proton, run a carbon, put it together for a particular handout. And I usually advocate, you know, running depth spectra routinely. So many students either don't know they exist or don't run them often enough, but they can be so powerful. And it's literally like two button presses and two minutes away from having this plethora of data. And I didn't do my own, you know, my own, didn't take my own advice on this one. So we ran the depth spectra. And sure enough, that's what explained what was going on in my, uh, in my carbon spectrum. Here's the carbon spectrum in the depth 90. Remember, depth 90 will show you carbons with one proton attached, and all other carbons should be suppressed, either truncated or gone completely. And sure enough, we see exactly what we would expect to see from ibuprofen. We see the aromatic uh, CH groups showing up very beautifully, and the two aliphatic CH groups also showing up very clearly. 
and then we ran the depth one third. Then I ran the depth one thirty five. And remember, this one shows you carbons with an odd number of protons attached, CHs and CH3s, uh, in their normal presentation with the peaks pointing up, but carbons with an even number of protons attached, CH2 groups, with their peaks pointing down, out of phase with the others. Neither depth experiment shows you quaternary carbons. So between a carbon, a depth 90, and a depth 135, you could tell the you know, number of protons attached to every carbon in your molecule. And this is what the depth 135 looked like. Now this is the interesting part right here. For a moment I thought I had a phasing issue or something. It looked like this peak was just badly distorted. Uh, and, but no, I checked the phasing and looked the, all the other peaks looked, looked fine. And then it finally dawned on me. It takes a while sometimes, but it finally dawned on me what I was looking at here. This is and this, these are two carbons. This one's signal, while it looks like a, a it's not, it doesn't even look split when you zoom in on it, is actually two carbons. And in fact, it's a CH group and a CH2 group. CH group in the depth 135 pointing up, the CH2 group, which is an ibuprofen, pointing down. Okay? And so, it is a lovely example of, you know, how we talk about in NMR spectroscopy, proton spectra, especially you get to the bigger molecule, often suffer from overlap. Protons just pile up in various areas like around 2 ppm and are difficult to interpret. Carbon has that big advantage of there's just, you know, there, the carbon chemical shifts are so much wider and that overlap is, and everything is a singlet, so we don't have that overlap issue. Ibuprofen is you know, a beautiful illustration of why that is a rule of thumb and it's not carved in stone. It's one example where the proton spectra are all beautifully separated and not overlapped and there's a bad overlap, an unresolvable overlap in the carbon spectrum. Uh, but the depth spectra make that very clear very nicely. So at least on our 400 megahertz instrument, these two carbons are <laughs> right over the top of each other. Now. It is indeed true that if you then do a heteronuclear HSQC experiment, the same result shows up very nicely. This one carbon, sure enough, is correlated with two very nicely distinct groups of protons. And so, point number one, ibuprofen is just a beautiful example molecule. Uh, you should use it more often if you're trying to teach NMR spectroscopy. It shows a lot of different things. and. There's a surprise lurking in there, okay? An instance of overlapped carbons and how the depth spectra, which are so powerful and I think underused, can really help resolve uh, uh, an interesting issue like this and just simply make structural analysis of determining unknown structures uh, much easier than it would be otherwise. So keep that in mind, consider it, and I'll talk to you later.